Hello, and welcome to another edition of NAIC Insights. I'm your host, Bob Green, and I am delighted to be joined today by Jose Feliciano, co-founder and managing partner of Clear Lake Capital Group. Welcome, Jose. Thank you, Bob. Very pleased and excited to be here with you uh, this afternoon. Hey, I appreciate it. Um, with all the stuff that you've got going on in the news and the, the deals and the new fun, it's exciting. So uh, let's get started right away. Um, when I do a Google search on you, it comes up that uh, Clear Lake has raised an amazingly uh, large new fund. Uh, tell me about it. Tell me what you accomplished and uh, just give me the story on the new fund. <clears throat> and when you Google me, typically what comes up is Jose Feliciano, the singer. So I'm glad that you uh, found I put an E in it. I put an E in it. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we just uh, closed uh, and announced uh, our latest flagship fund. Clearly yep. Capital 7. Uh, Clearly Capital 7, uh, basically we just exceeded, uh, the target was $10 billion. Uh, we were, once again, luckily, thanks to our the support of our LPs, we were oversubscribed. So we ended up at $14.1 uh, billion. Um, yeah, very excited, very proud of that fund for, for many reasons. You know, that, that fund basically uh, allows us to play offense in, in, at a time where the world and the economy and the market may be going through an inflection point. So from a timing perspective, although we don't typically try to time our funds, it's actually a really opportune time. Uh, and the other thing from a purely, you know, kind of just being proud of the, the firm and what we have been able to build, it, it's actually a, a little interesting footnote, you know, so so that fund makes us uh, the firm that has raised a 10 billion plus fund, uh, the quickest, I guess, from inception. So from inception of the firm to getting to a 10 billion plus fund, which typically people define as bulge bracket or however you want to call it, mm -hmm. uh, I guess we it took us the, the shortest amount of time for whatever that's worth. So, so very excited uh, that we were able to do that. Mostly, mostly uh, very feeling very fortunate and uh, grateful to our LPs to once again uh, backing us in, in what is, a, as, as always, a new fund. It's always a new adventure, a new opportunity to uh, to invest. But it's also another time where our LPs have to kind of place their trust and confidence in us uh, for 10 plus years. So, so very excited about it. That's outstanding. Congratulations. I'm super happy for you, Bedad, and the entire firm. Uh, and from my perspective, very well deserve all of the success uh, that you guys have had. Uh, let's back up, though. We're going to have an opportunity to talk about the firm and the fund and a lot of other things. But uh, one of the traditions um, in this the very short time that we've been leveraging this platform is to really give our guests the opportunity to go back and tell us a little bit more about themselves and you know, look, um, the, the, the more successful you are, Jose, the, the more that's out there about the story. But take us back. I, I literally want to go back before you were in finance, before, you know, Stanford, Princeton. I actually want to go back to your home, um, you know, of Puerto Rico and talk to us uh, about what it was like in the early years you growing up. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so as you're alluding to, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Um, uh, you know, I would say you know, pretty normal uh, childhood. Uh, my, my, my father was uh, an engineer, civil engineer, worked for the public uh, electric utility. He worked, that, that was his job his whole life. Um, my mom basically did this work there as well, but actually she became a homemaker when, when she had me. I'm the, I'm the eldest, I have a brother, a uh, younger brother. Um, and we grew up in what I would call a middle class household, maybe maybe lower middle class, but middle class. Uh, but as I look back, you know, some things that I think, you know, made a real difference. You know, one of them was uh, that from a very early age, my parents emphasized education. You know, they were very, very focused on making sure that they provided the best education possible. And they sacrificed a lot for that. So I actually went to private school. Uh, you probably can't tell given my accent, but but it was a mostly all English uh, instruction uh, school. So I was able to to not only learn Spanish, but uh, English as well, which obviously became significant or important as I went to school in the U.S. later on. Um, and yeah, from early on, I, 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 I developed what I would say is a passion to learn, to uh, be curious. Right. You know, I think uh, seeing my dad being an engineer and I was good at math and science, uh, I always had a fascination for how things worked, and I actually thought I was going to be an engineer. I thought uh, my my dream job uh, 
believe it or not, I was to be a pilot, uh, but my eyesight was not good enough. So, so I, I decided to go to into the less interesting but more lucrative uh, field of finance. But um, I have fun memories of being, you know, kind of being back home in Puerto Rico. And I was just there uh, a few weeks ago. So, so that that was so the formative years, and and I still obviously have a special place in my heart for for my little island. That's awesome. Um, the there is a story, and I think I've heard you tell it. And of course, you uh, went to Princeton. But is it true that you had never seen the campus before going there? What tell, is that true, Jose? It is true. So, so fast forward a little bit. You know, I went to a very small high school. We had a class of uh, literally less than forty people. Um, not a feeder, not the traditional feeder to the okay. Ivy Leagues. Uh, and there are a few, you know, really good schools in Puerto Rico that 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 do provide a, you know most of the students that come from the island to the Ivy League. I honestly didn't know a whole lot about the Ivy League. Um, like everybody, perhaps, you know, Harvard, I would say out of the Ivy League schools has the better brand globally. And, you know, I knew about Harvard, knew very little about Princeton. A good friend of mine, classmate of mine, um, she was the president of the class. I was the vice president. Uh, she applied to Princeton. And um, and my focus at that point was engineering. You know, so I ended up uh, becoming a, or graduating as a mechanical and aerospace engineer. But I was very focused on engineering schools. So I was very focused on more uh, technical schools. Uh, even he, I applied to a few schools here in the U.S., but most of them were actually, you know, kind of, uh, again, engineering driven schools. I thought I was going to stay back home and, and go. There's a very good engineering school part of the University of Puerto Rico system. But um, but I did apply to Princeton. Um, I had never visited the campus. I knew very little about the campus. To this day, I attribute, you know, and, and and when we talk about role models and mentors, you know, which I think is our important component of how we can develop and and, and set our sights, you know, and, and to 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 set goals and um, not not a traditional mentor, but you know, Princeton, when you filled the first part of the application, they would typically assign you a uh, alumni um, interviewer. And that interviewer, I think, changed my life. Uh, it was a gentleman called Ronald Blackburn. Actually, he passed away recently. He lived in D.C. and ran a nonprofit called Aspira. But, um, but he came to our house and interviewed me and talked to my parents. And, and I remember vividly uh, you know, this interview. And, and, and he did a great job of convincing my parents, even more than, than me, that, uh, that Princeton was this uh, idyllic uh, <laughs> utopian place uh, that existed in New Jersey. And um, and little known, right? You know, I had not finished my application, and, and I had already uh, the deadline had passed. So I'm never, I'll never know if Ronald, you know, Mr. Blackburn did it or somebody else. But the week after that interview, I got a letter from Princeton saying, "You have a week to to finalize your application. We'll give you kind of an extension, uh, and we'll consider your application." And I did. And I got in and yeah, sure enough, you know, I, the first time I visited the campus was I had my little suitcase, my parents, my brother uh, were there and uh, I saw the campus uh, for the first time. That's an amazing story. What, um, Jose, you've had a lot of success and frankly, your name right now, even before you turn 50 is, is absolutely synonymous with success in the finance circles. What, if anything, did you struggle with, you know, either in undergrad um, or, or as you sort of made your way into the mainland U.S.? Yeah. Well, um, so, so the great thing about a field like finance is that to some extent uh, it is outcome driven, right? You know, so... So I've been lucky that I, I have landed in a few places where, where it didn't matter how I looked, you know, my accent didn't matter, uh, where people recognized, right, you know, kind of the talent perhaps or whatever I had to deliver um, and the outcomes, you know, the ability to perform, the ability in, in, in the case of Clear Lake, you know, to, to generate great performance has differentiated us and allowed us to succeed. But um, but even at Princeton, even even later on, you know, kind of when I went to work at Goldman Sachs, I think there was always this fear, right? You know, and, and maybe that this fear is the the typical immigrant kid, you know, the, this imposter syndrome, you know, whatever you want to call it, right? You know, but this fear that I was not going to succeed, this fear that I didn't belong. Um, 
And, you know, going to Princeton was a perfect example, right? You know, yeah, did, did I think I was smart and I could, you know, kind of compete? Yeah, I, I actually did. Uh, and I, I have, I haven't, I feel, I feel like I have a fair amount of self-confidence and self-esteem, but the reality is that, you know, there were kids that were much better prepared that came from places where, you know, they understood what a physics lab or chemistry lab was, you know, and I had never seen, uh, a, you know, facilities like that until I came to Princeton. So, so, so I basically, that intersection of, you know, kind of intellect, talent, ability, but also experience, um, uh, it was difficult at the beginning, you know, kind of making that transition, understanding that, you know, I, I didn't have the same preparation perhaps that others, but I had the same potential. Yeah. Uh, and if I worked a little harder than others, you know, I could develop that potential and catch up. And, and, and that's what I did. You know, so my first year at Princeton, for example, was a very tough year. Um, I was learning a new culture, uh, some would say a new language. Uh, yeah. And at the same time, I was competing with the best of the best. Right. You know, so so that was a very you know kind of. Uh, challenging uh, transition period for me, uh, but at the end of that year, I, I I came away with a with a lot of confidence because at the end of the day, even though the the start was a little rough, uh, I knew I could compete. Yeah. And for the la last three years at Princeton, I I knew I was as smart as anybody else, and and maybe maybe I had to overcome some things that others didn't, um, but I knew I could, and <laughs> and and that was, that was that was an important catalyst for me. It sounds like that experience, I don't want to say changed you because you are who you are and you probably are very similar to who you were in high school. But an experience like that has to change you. You mentioned, you know, you know, becoming braver and more confident and understanding that you can compete. Are elements of that still a part of who you are? Just have they become a part of the DNA of who you are? Because you're doing a lot of stuff. You're 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 you and your partners and your firm are becoming the first to do a lot of things, right? You mentioned one already, and maybe we'll talk about some more later, but did that fearlessness come as a part of that experience or was that experience just one of the things that you did and demonstrated in the fearlessness? Yeah. So one, um, I reject the promise of your question in the sense that it's not fearlessness. Okay. I still have fear. Okay. You know, and but it's channeling that fear. Right? You know, one of the things that people think, you know, when when you when you do public speaking, when you jump off a mountain, when you go, you do something that you have never done before. Most of the people doing that, I think, are experiencing some type of fear. Right? You know, but it's how do you channel that? Right? You know, it's the ability to basically take that um, as almost you know a point of comfort, a point of inspiration, right? You know, channeling that and using that fear to basically inspire yourself and, and say, you know what, I can do it. And it many times, you know, that that belief, you know, starts with yourself. You, you got to believe uh, that you are capable of doing that. Sometimes it helps to see a mentor or role model having achieved something similar or, or, or better um, uh, that, that again inspires you and says, you know what, even though I'm a little bit afraid of it, even though I'm a little concerned that, that I may fail, I will I will try it. Yeah. Um, and if you set your, your 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 sights high enough, right, you know, even if you fail a little bit, you may you may still actually end up in a really good place. And I think to your point, so I do agree that that still drives me, you know, that still drives us. Um, I have been very lucky to to partner, you know, I think you mentioned my co-founder, Badatic Bali, but but in many ways, you know, his story is similar to to my story. Yeah. Um, and and we are we're still the same people that we were, I think, uh, 20 years ago, you know, kind of uh, or 25 years ago, certainly 16 years ago when we started the firm. And we we try to channel, you know, in, in those challenges. We try to channel those fears. We try to challenge those insecurities into pushing one another, pushing the firm, pushing those around us into being better versions of themselves. Right. You know, and. To this day, when you know somebody joins the firm, you know any, anybody at Clear Lake can probably tell you, and they have probably heard me say this twenty thousand times, right? You know, if you're somebody that thinks that they can perform and win alone, you're going to do great somewhere else, but not at Clear Lake, right? You know, but if you're the type of person that you're great, great performer, intelligent, um, but also are trying to make those around you better, uh, 
Uh, and that means also, you know, helping those around you kind of overcome their challenges and their fears and, and their concerns. Then you're going to succeed at Clear Lake. And, and, and that to this day, I think, is very much part of our DNA as a firm. So um, you graduate successfully from Princeton. You um, meet your wife there. I'll come back to Kwanzaa later because we're going to talk about Supercharged a bit. But um, you cross country, other side of the country. You don't go back to Puerto Rico. Um, you go to Stanford. And that's the, you know, the, the, now you're on the pathway for Silicon Valley and, you know, at least that aspect of finance. Uh, I don't want to dwell on Stanford, but what, what was the key experience? What was the key learning in addition to getting a, a wonderful MBA uh, education there? <laughs> well, um, so, you know, between, between Princeton and Stanford, I, I, I worked at Goldman Sachs for, for, for a few years. Yep. Uh, that was my taste of, of Wall Street yep. uh, and finance. Um, I knew I wanted to, I, I, at, at, at Goldman, I decided that, you know, being an investment banker was fantastic. It was an incredible experience. You know, one that obviously opened up a whole new world for me. Uh, so as an experience, as a preparation, as, as a, that first job, I think it was an incredible opportunity, but I decided, or I thought that it would be a lot more interesting to be on the investing side, you know, basically not only, you know, kind of understanding and, lear and learning about these companies on a one-off basis, but, you know, kind of make learning what makes them tick and helping them grow essentially. Um, and when I looked around, you know, I felt that given my background as an engineer, I was very good with the numbers, but I felt that there was a lot about business that I needed to learn. So hence the MBA or the idea of getting an MBA. And then when I started to think about, you know, Stanford and other schools, and I won't mention the other schools that I, that I applied to and may have gotten in and didn't go to, but, uh, but Stanford, even at that moment in time, like now, you know, occupied a really interesting space in business and entrepreneurship and, and innovation and technology, right? You know, and, and when you look at Stanford today, but even back then, um, one of the things that makes Stanford unique is uh, that it's not an establishment school, right? You know, it's a newer school. It's not part of the traditional Ivy League. It's very much embedded uh, with Silicon Valley. Um, and it's very much focused on innovation, right? You know, disrupting different industries and different businesses. And and maybe at that point, I wouldn't have used these words, but but I think I have always been attracted to that idea that the combination of innovation, disruption, entrepreneurship uh, can serve as a catalyst for many of us to to achieve things that you know we did, wouldn't think possible, right? You know that that and, and those are the the that innovation are the things, or it's one of the things that allows society to 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 transform itself and 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 to change very very rapidly and i i kind of felt that i wanted to be part of that vanguard right and mm -hmm. and so for me stanford was uh in some respects an easy choice it was the right choice um so i learned a lot from my fellow students it was a wonderful opportunity to kind of learn and and, and get a better experience or, or more well-rounded perspective on business Mm -hmm. um, perhaps as importantly, it was an incredible experience to learn about other entrepreneurs yeah. and that entrepreneurial journey. And one thing that I love about Stanford and, and, and that whole ethos in Silicon Valley is that failure is actually celebrated. That's right. uh, and that's one of the things that I think we need to learn, uh, particularly in our communities. Oftentimes we're so focused, right, you know, kind of on success. And we're so afraid, you know, going back to that fear and, and, and uh uh, uh, point. But in Silicon Valley, failure is celebrated. Mm -hmm. Most entrepreneurs, you know, that are successful have failed one or two or three times before right. that very successful, more public uh, success. Yeah. And I love that, right? You know, I love that um, there was that space to succeed, but that also that space to fail and experiment. And that was actually not looked down upon. It was actually uh, embraced and celebrated. So I love how you talk about failure being celebrated. We don't talk about that much in finance. Uh, and I think your LPs uh, are happy that you don't talk about that much in finance. But you're right. It, it is a character builder. It's a motivator. It's a channeler. So I, I totally get that. I want to fast forward to get us uh, to 2005, 2006. So the idea um, comes from somewhere. The inspiration comes from somewhere. 
uh, and you and Bedad come together to form this new firm. You're, by anybody's definition, you're doing really well. You're a former Goldman. You've got a couple of amazing degrees. You're at Tannenbaum. You're, you know, made partner. I mean, stuff is just going really well. And you decide to leap off the cliff and start a new firm. Uh, tell us about that. And literally, I, I'm most concerned, most interested, Jose, in the formative part of the idea when it's a cocktail napkin and yeah. what was the real vision for Clear Lake in those moments? Yeah. So, so I think like, like for, for many of us, you know, the entrepreneurial journey is complicated and one that sometimes it's difficult to pinpoint, you know, what that eureka moment, you know, I think for, for me and for us, uh, it took a few years, you know, I, I think it was a combination of things. It was the idea that having seen a, a couple cycles at that point from the investing perspective, you know, I have been a, an investor. I've been in finance at that point uh, for over a decade, and I have been an investor for about half of that time, you know, about six, six years. Um, I had seen a couple cycles and I had seen how traditional private equity investors had invested in, in up times, you know, kind of in, in, in up cycles and in, in, in the recovery part of the cycle or the more benign part of the cycle. And I had also seen how those same investors try to take advantage or not uh, of kind of the downside of the cycle, you know, the, the recessions, et cetera. I'd seen that how we at Tenenbaum, you know, more of a special situations firm were dealt with the same thing. Um, and we felt that there was a better way, that there was a better strategy, a better uh, opportunity to capture an opportunity, particularly at that point in the middle market uh, throughout, you know, so, so we felt that there was a better model that would allow a firm to invest across an economic and credit cycle consistently by taking advantage of, you know, kind of the best of private equity and the best of special situations. So, so first and foremost, we did think we had identified a market niche that was underserved, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we had an idea that was differentiated and we had a vision about how to do that. At the same time, I would say that, you know, kind of, I had a lot of, at that point, I had experienced not only that ethos of innovation and disruption and entrepreneurship that Stanford, you know, kind of teaches you, but I had also, um, I had also failed. I had also had a very public failure in a, in a startup company uh, during the dot-com boom and era. And there were a lot of lessons from that, but but one of the things that always attracted me, maybe maybe like a moth is attracted to the light, um, is that I did enjoy that entrepreneurial journey, right? You know, as an entrepreneur, you have to enjoy the journey because it's difficult and it's very uncertain. The destination is very uncertain. Um, and I knew that I had the appetite for that risk I had the appetite for a failure. I, you know, I had already failed once very publicly. Uh, it was painful, but I survived. Um, and I had that belief, you know, maybe some naivete, right? You know, that 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 we could build something bigger and better uh, in an industry that at that point we thought was actually ready for that type of innovation. So, so it was that combination, the right time in my life and my partner's lives, uh, not being afraid of that entrepreneurial journey and potential failure. And having this idea, having this belief, you know, kind of somewhat irrational, irrational belief uh, that we could actually create uh, something a little bit different uh, that would that would that would succeed and, and, and would actually differentiate itself from whatever was available out there. And, 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 and that was kind of the premise, you know, and, and we went out and talked to a few people. And finally, we found somebody that would back us. Uh, we were young, you know. I was as I was, I think, the the oldest uh, one of the of the founders, and I was thirty three at the point at that point. So, so it was it was it was a uh, it, it was an exciting time. At the same time, there was that fear that we were talking about before, right? You know, failure. But uh, but we channeled that into a lot of hard work, a lot of grit, and and we made it work. So you're you're raising the first Clear Lake Fund, Clear Lake Fund One, and you and I both know that. There, there's no shortage of smart people in the business. There's actually not really a shortage of people that know how to do deals and have thesis and investment. Um, but there are people who help you in the first fund, people that give you a break. Um, want to take the opportunity to talk about, you don't have to name them, but just some of the people that were helpful 
in the first fund. And clearly, I didn't meet you until the second fund. So this is not pandering for my uh, my flowers here. Who are some of the people that were really helpful in the first fund, Jose? Yeah. So the way we did it, you know, uh, one, you know, the, 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 the first quote unquote fund was just a seed fund, right? You know, so we had one investor and we partnered with a larger firm called Reservoir Capital. And we wouldn't be here with them without them. So Craig Huff, Dan Stern and that firm. Um, that allowed us to experiment, right? You know, that was kind of like the Petri dish uh, yep. <laughs> where we had to, we were able to experiment. You know, oftentimes as a new firm, it's difficult because you're basically flying the plane, but you're building it at the same time. We had, we, we were afforded a few years, a couple of years, where we were able to, with just one LP, uh, focus on our strategy, on the team. And then when we went out to, for, to, that, to raise that first institutional fund, we were a little bit better prepared than most. Yeah. Having said that, to your point, uh, we were not quite ready. A couple of things. We had not really road tested what our strategy looked like or, or what, how to describe our strategy to an institutional LP base. Uh, that is different certainly than, than how you describe it to just one LP that may not need you to put you in a bucket or may not have a department of private equity or, or, or fixed income or whatever else, right? You know, so we had to learn how to tell the story. Um, and we also went out to market in that first institutional fund in the summer of 2008, which summer of 2008, if we go back that far, right? You know, the, the, the clouds were in the horizon, but by the fall or winter of 2008, the world had changed. So we've all of a sudden encountered, you know, a very turbulent market. There were definitely people that were there for us early on, you know, and actually, you know, there's some that are very near and dear to my heart. You know, I, I remember talking about, you know, kind of racing or starting to raise the first fund. And, and I was actually at the consortium in New York in an elevator and Kelly Williams was uh, in, in the same elevator uh, talking about a, 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 what a small world and, and she was there with Mina Pacheco, again, you know, two names that a lot of people in our industry would know very well. And they said, you know, why, why don't you come by and, and tell us a story? And, and, and we kind of went by probably a week later and, 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 and did the pitch. And it was awful. <laughs> it was horrible. Um, but you know what? Out of that, you know, they, they were super gracious. You know, and again, to this day, I, I'm eternally grateful for Kelly. You know, she gave us a lot of feedback about how to tell our story it was not that our strategy was wrong. It was not that what we were doing uh, was any better or worse than what other people were doing. There was actually a nugget there of an idea that was extremely interesting. And as, as I was talking before, truly differentiated, but we didn't know how to tell the story. We didn't have that translation, how to tell the story to institutional LP base. And that's where I think people like Kelly and others really help. Um, and I'm glad to say, you know, for example, at that point, the credit, the Credit Suisse, you know, kind of uh, 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 group, you know, was one of our first investors in that first close in November of 2008. Uh, but there were many others, you know, folks uh, like, you know, now Harvard Best, you know, Ed Powers and that group, you know, at that point at BAMO or, or you know, even a group that's no longer with us, but, you know, Fidel and Robert and Cesar mm -hmm. from Sentinela. And, you know, there were many people, you know, Pat Miller at Newberger. Um, I'm sure I'm going to miss some people, so I apologize to those that are missing, but there were many people that placed their trust early on on, on Clear Lake on our fund, our strategy, and I'll be eternally grateful. And they were, by the way, the, you know, the, the, the flip side of that is that there were some funny memories, right? You know, I won't name names, but there was one meeting that I remember vividly where somebody sat down, they passed, uh, and they, were, they thought they were being helpful, by the way. And they sat down with us and they said, you know, listen, Jose, you know, I, I want to give you real feedback. I said, you know, I'm ready. Uh, and the feedback was, you guys are never going to make it. You, this is not a private equity strategy. Re your returns will never be good enough. Yep. Um, uh, you should try something else. Yep. And uh, I'm, I'm glad I didn't listen to, to that person. But, uh, but we got that type of feedback as well, right? You know, you have to have thick skin. And, and that entrepreneurial journey means that you have to have that belief, right? You know, that belief, sometimes irrational belief that you're going to succeed and that you are building and doing something different. And that and that and that you have figured out something that nobody else has. And some people believed us and some people did it. Uh, but I'm eternally grateful for those that did and, and backed us. Yeah. You know, Jose, thank you for your candor around that, uh, because too often. Well, first of all, th these videos are viewed by lots of emerging managers, lots of first time funds, and they're in the throes of it right now. They're trying to get people to believe in them. They're questioning themselves. They're looking back over the shoulder. They're looking out ahead. 
And it is those people, as you mentioned, Kelly and Mina and uh, the others that you mentioned that recognize that they need to help you develop the story, but the ingredients for success are there. So I appreciate you sharing the story about them. As we talk about the success, we can't talk about the success without getting into the deals. And um, you have um, invested in a number of special situations, number of turnarounds. You have a unique way of approaching the marketplace. There's a three letter acronym beginning with O that I won't articulate, but I'll, I'll see if I can get you to talk a little bit about that. Tell us about how Clear Lake approaches investing in deals. Yeah. So, so from early on, you know, if I was doing the, the, the quick description, you know, the way we think about Clear Lake is from the very beginning, we decided that we were going to be sector specialists, but not only one sector. So we invest in technology, industrials, a little bit of consumer. Um, we try to overlay two or three things. When we invest, we're, we're very focused on understanding those sectors very much like any other sector focused fund would, maybe deeper in some cases. We try to then think about how to invest in those sectors across an economic and credit cycle. So to your point, you know, oftentimes or we, we can do anything from a traditional pure play buyout in many cases, you know, with a growth orientation. We can do more complicated deals like carve outs, turnarounds. And we can do very complicated deals in some cases, even, you know, kind of touching the stress and turnarounds. Um, to us, those are just different entry points, different ways to invest in the sectors that we love, mm -hmm. to partner with the management teams that we think are great management teams. Uh, and in many cases, in situations that we think we can add value. And ultimately, our job is easy, right? Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is invest our funds, mostly other people's money, but a lot of our own. And we're trying to make these companies bigger and better. The way we do that is very complicated or it can get very complicated. Over the years, we have tried to codify what we have learned, the good and the bad, you know, the best practices, if you will, into what we call now OPS, which is operations people strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's just a framework. It's, it's, it's actually not rocket science. Mm -hmm. It's actually just looking at those three aspects of a business, operations, people, strategy, understanding where we can make the biggest difference, where we can, we can create the most significant impact in the, in the quickest time frame that we can, and understanding what really, really matters. Right? You know, oftentimes, you know, it, it, it's, it's a standard operating procedure for private equity firms to hire very smart people, consultants perhaps, and create these 100-day checklists. And these checklists look like massive you know, spreadsheets, and, and you have 100 things. That, that you want to change or you want to improve. And that's great. And we do that too. But what we have really learned over the years is that it also really, really matters to come up with the two or three or four or five things that really make a difference. That really kind of, you know, where your thesis, your investment thesis revolves around those two, three, four, five things. And if you really focus, you know, in the first 18, 24 months on those things, even if you don't completely get them right, even if you get them a slightly wrong here and there, um, chances are that you're going to make a meaningful impact in the trajectory of that business. So what I'm focused on, you know, when I'm sitting in an investment committee thinking about an investment is how is it that we're going to make a difference, right? You know, what is it that Clear Lake brings to the table that's a little bit different than others? Why is it that we're looking at this business a little bit differently than others? How is it that we're going to change the growth path of this business the inflection point on that growth curve to to allow or you know unshackle you know kind of uh, that next step or that next um, that next uh, phase of growth of that business. Mm -hmm. And if we can find that right, you know, not only you know is this business a good business that we understand with a good management team that we think we're buying at a good price, but what is it that we're going to do different differently? Then that makes for a great clear lake investment. And that could mean that we're basically approaching the investment. Uh, you, we have a different strategy. It may mean that we have a better or uh, a management team or a board member that we think can make a big difference. It may mean that you know we have a out an acquisition. You know that from a strategy perspective is going to change the, the the growth path of that business. Uh, it may be that we have a better way of buying that business through a carve out or you know even a distressed situation. But we have to find that point of differentiation. We have to really understand why is it that we are smarter than others? You know, why is it that we're willing to pay a little bit more than others in this situation to make money? 
And consistently over the years, I think we have gotten better at that. And as we have grown as a firm and the funds have gotten bigger, we actually have defied gravity a little bit where you know, our larger funds have done equally as well, sometimes better than our smaller funds. And I think part of that is that we are better investors today than we were 15 years ago. And we certainly have found better ways of consistently applying those principles and those lessons. OPS is a big part of that to make these companies bigger and better. And we can do that consistently. Sometimes we get lucky and we actually not only make these companies bigger and better, we actually sell them at a better multiple, higher multiple than what we actually bought them at. And that makes for a great private equity investment. You know, we have a thing at NAIC called the Home Run Club, and it's a posting board where we post deals that are above 4X. And I have literally had to take down your logo to give other people room because you guys have posted so many deals above 4X. And it was one of them that had, it was a two digit number with a two in front of it and a three behind it. And I literally said, no, this can't be right. We've, we've confused something. I, look, I know that everybody's got compliance and I'm not going to take you down that road, but the track record, the deals, the success is just absolutely amazing. And yet you guys continue to do new things. So congrats to you on, on what you guys are building. Thank I want to get into, if you will, the partnerships. Whenever one of my favorite books uh, is an examination of, of partners of private equity firms. You have, you know, Kravitz, Colbert and Roberts. You have Conway and Rubenstein. And while nobody runs around because you named the firm Clear Lake, talking about Feliciano and Egg Bali, uh, I've had a chance to work with both of you. You've both served on the NAIC board. And I'm, I'm actually consider myself friends with both of you. But you're different people. You bring you bring different styles to the table. And clearly that formula works. What What's the mix? How, how do you and Bedad approach getting to a yes, uh, whether it's expanding Clear Lake or doing a particular deal outside of the, the general investment framework? How do two very different people get to a yes and get it right so often? Yeah. Oh, boy. Well, one, you know, we, we, we have gotten it wrong many times, but... Uh, but I like to think that we have gotten it right maybe slightly more times and, and maybe in the, in the things that really matter. But I think I think you're right. You know, uh, when, as I reflect, uh, and, and this is a part of the conversation that I guess maybe I, I get to talk about myself in the third person. But uh, yeah. um, as I reflect on our partnership, um, it's built on a few things, a few foundations. You know, I think one of them is even though we're very different people and very different personalities, you know, I think our objective from I would say the very beginning has been clear and has we have had that objective in common, right? You know, which is to build a firm, the best firm we can, and to always put that firm first and, and not, you know, kind of our own personal, our own personal kind of brand, our own personal interest ahead of that, right? You know, we we from very early on decided that, you know, kind of the best for the firm will be the best for the two of us collectively and our other partners and our, our employees and, and, and limited partners. Um, and hence, you know, if, if there's a fantastic deal that it's quote unquote his deal and I can make that better, you know, I will do that. Right. You know, and the same goes with, you know, kind of for me and, and, and the, the same way that he would interact uh, with me. And then, and then over time, I think that percolates, you know, in the team, right? You know, and I think that uh, it, it doesn't become then, then it is, it's never my deal or his deal. It's it's, it's a clear lake deal, right? Um, I think as a partner in a partnership, you have to learn how to disagree, and and we also learn how to disagree, you know, early on, you know, and making those disagreements not personal again because we never question or we were not questioning. Uh, our motives, you know, we were basically, we felt that our motives were, were pure, uh, mm -hmm. that we wanted to make each other better. And it goes to what I was talking about before, right? You know, like that, that's kind of that measure or that, that, uh, uh, that test, if you will, that, that we have for, for our people, right? You know, I said, are you trying to make the firm better? Or are you trying to make those around you better? And I, and I think that's always been our objective. So over, over the years, then you develop that trust. Um, and, and then 
I actually think that oftentimes, you know, kind of relationships, you know, the partnerships become stronger in difficult time periods. And I think we were talking a little bit, a little bit about, you know, kind of those tougher times, you know, in, in 2008, when we were raising our first few, you know, our first institutional fund. And those were difficult times. There were many times that, you know, if you had called us at that point and we had the behind closed doors told you everything that we were thinking about, you know, we, we didn't think or we thought that there was a good chance we couldn't make it. Right. But some people rise up to the occasion and and some people don't. Some pe some partnerships break down under that pressure and, and some and some don't. You know, I don't want to be cliche, but, you know, that's, uh, uh, that, that's how you forge, uh, you know, steel, right? You know, they're very high pressure or diamonds or whatever other analogy you want to come up with. You know, they're very high pressure in difficult situations. And, and I think going through those difficult situations, going through difficult time periods early on in the life cycle of our firm made us a lot stronger and made our partnership a lot stronger. And at the same time, right, you know, we were able to push each other, right? You know, I think over time, he has become a little bit more like me and I have become a little bit more like him, yeah. but we still challenge each other, right? You know, we still have conversations. We, we just did a very significant investment, at least high profile investment. And we were, we have to make some decisions, you know, really early on. And we were, you know, it was probably one o'clock in the morning, his time. And I don't know what time, my time. And, and we were having the same discussions, honestly, that we were having about small investments 15 years ago, but now there are a lot more zeros and there's a lot, the deals are a lot more high profile, but we still have the same type of partnership that we did. So I'm very grateful, you know, that, that, that I have uh, that as a partner. Again, appreciate the answer. It's, uh, those are not easy things to talk about to a broad audience. I had an occasion recently to talk to um, someone that I consider myself to be a mentor for. And several years ago, uh, this individual joined your firm. She's very talented. Uh, and she had this big smile on her face recently. And I asked her about it. And I said, you look really happy. And she said, I'm super happy. I said, work going well? She said, that's why I'm so happy. She said, I am at the best place that I have ever worked. And I said, wow, um, is it the money? And she said, the money is the money. She said, it's the leadership and the culture. You just talked about the leadership, but I want you to spend a few minutes talking about the culture because this person was beaming about the culture of the firm. And look, I've been to Clear Lake's offices. I've I've had the wonderful lunch you provide and I see, you know, everybody working. But there is a there is a palpable positive culture within the walls of your firm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, again, yeah, I'm, I'm blushing now, but. Um, even going back to the earlier question, right, you know, one of the reasons that. That we set out and set up our own firm was that belief that I was talking about in terms of, you know, strategy, but there was also a, a more intangible, more touchy feely component, which is we felt that we could create slightly different culture than the typical, the prototypical culture that people think about at least in Wall Street. Um, and to, and truth be told, I saw some of that at my old firm at, at, uh, at uh, Goldman Sachs, right? You know, when I was there, it was still a partnership. It was still a private uh, investment bank. And there was a lot of focus on that culture of teamwork, of, of basically no superstars, you know, winning as a team, et cetera. So, so there was a lot of lessons that came with that. So, so when we started thinking about Clear Lake, you know, early on, we did think a lot about what culture we wanted as a firm. And, and we have some you know, core values that we talk about, you know, and those core values include things like humility, right? You know, and as a kind of a little tongue in cheek, we say, even if we have to work at it, right? You know, we want to be humble because mm -hmm. we've been very lucky. Uh, and we think only with humility, you know, can you really learn about yourself and learn from your mistakes, you know, and that's another one of our values, right? You know, trying to have that constant um, sense of improvement, of learning from your mistakes, of getting better, um, not from a very arrogant perspective, but from the perspective of, even though we're doing well, there are things that we can do better. Yeah. And this is a very competitive industry, right? You know, and those that, you know, kind of dwell on their, on their past success will not be successful in the future. Uh, we care about teamwork. And again, this concept of making those around you better, right? You know, kind of, there's a lot of examples in professional sports, for example, that they're great individual performers and they get the they're, they get in the record books, but many of them, you know, don't don't win the championships, right? You know, and we're in the business, 
not of getting in the record book. We're in the business of winning championships. Yeah. We want to make each other better. We want to win, win or lose, by the way, yeah. as a team. And we want to have a long-term perspective. And we want to think outside the box. Yeah. And that's what another one of our core values. If you come here to Clear Lake, one of the things that you see is, you know, we have a bunch of these old school Apple uh, marketing uh, posters, you know, the one from the Think Different campaign, which have, you know, basically essentially geniuses. We don't think we're geniuses, uh, but we can aspire to be. Uh, but many of them are people that revolutionize their respective fields in politics, sports, arts, um, finance, business. And they did it thinking a little bit differently than everybody else. And I think if there's something that I aspire to is uh, is to and, and continue to aspire to is to create a firm that is always willing to challenge itself, to learn from our mistakes and successes, but you learn more from the mistakes and recreate ourselves, be a better firm, think differently and succeed as a team. And, and, and all those things, right, you know, kind of are embedded, I think, in the culture. Culture, though, is a... It's a funny thing, right? You know, it's a very amorphous thing. I can I can talk about our culture, I can talk about our values, but you have to live those values, right? You know, and oftentimes firms have aspirational values and mission statements that they don't really adhere to. And I think also we have been better than most yeah. about being congruent with those aspirational values. We're not perfect. Yeah. Uh, we're not there yet. These are all aspirational. We'll never get there to the, that perfect point of nirvana. But we have done a decent job of living, you know, uh, hopefully from the top down to try to live to and live up to those values. And, and, and that's what we aspire to do every single day. Yeah, that's outstanding. So I want to turn the page a little bit, maybe leave Clear Lake um, and talk a little bit about some of the other things you do. Um, uh, you clearly have created a lot of business success. And I think people always want to understand what uh, what your philanthropic uh, lens looks like. Um, and you actually have spent quite a bit of time being very thoughtful about how you and frankly, how you and Kwanzaa approach your philanthropy. Can you talk a little bit about the Supercharged Initiative and what you are trying to do and achieving there? Yeah. So, so we've been very lucky uh, and we, we do try to give back. Mm-hmm. Not out of a sense of, um, well, out of a sense of, you know, kind of being grateful for what we, we have been able to achieve and a sense that we can help others uh, achieve, you know, maybe similar success or, or, or whatever success they can attain. And, and so we try to distill, you know, kind of that into a few core pillars. Uh, those pillars include things like, equity and entrepreneurship and education and um, empowerment. Um, And we have tried to find ways, you know, to then give back to the community, our communities, in a way that's a creative, in a way that, you know, I don't think of, I don't think of a donation to a nonprofit as a donation. I think of it as investment. It's a different type of investment with a different type of return profile. And that return profile may not be able to be measured just financially, but it is an investment uh, and we want that investment to have an impact. Um, the most visible thing that we have done, the two most visible things, you know, that come out of the Supercharged Initiative is a clear commitment to education. You know, I think education for most of our communities. And when I say our communities um, at this point, I want to you know, kind of highlight, right? You know, like uh, there are underserved communities out there, you know, uh, particularly black and brown communities that haven't had, uh, the upper, same opportunities, sometimes kids out of these communities haven't had the same, particularly here in the U.S., haven't had the same opportunities than others. Um, and we're trying to create sometimes that kind of level playing field. I think education can be an incredible catalyst, you know, for that. And it's certainly in my experience, in my life, education has definitely made a difference, right? You know, I wouldn't be where I am without having been gone to Princeton and Stanford. So, so creating opportunities in terms of education has been important and a lot of... Uh, the, the 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 investments that we have made at a supercharged initiative have been focused on education. The other thing that has been visible is how to create more clear links, right? You know, how to create, uh, uh, how, how do we create that next generation of uh, clear links, Vista Equity, Sears Capital, uh, Palladiums, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
and I think part of it is recognizing that there's a lot of talent out there, uh, that raising the first fund or that first dollar is, is the most difficult uh, thing that we're doing. So, so the Supercharge Initiative has been investing, and this is actually a for-profit part of it. We have been investing in funds led by women and, and other underserved minorities, and, and we have done that pretty consistently. I think almost $100 million of committed capital to funds led by underrepresented minorities or, or women. Um, we're not doing that out of purely philanthropic, uh, a purely philanthropic perspective. You know, we're investing in people that we think are going to succeed, that are great investors. Uh, we say no all the time, and that's difficult because I, I I've been in the in the receiving end of, of of that type of rejection or somebody that says no to me, and we all have that belief that we we actually can invest, that we can do better, but we we have to we cannot invest in everybody. But I think extending that ladder. Uh, allowing others or giving others the opportunity to prove themselves. Um, many of these firms are not going to make it mm-hmm. They're not going to have great funds. Mm-hmm. Uh, but others, I think there's, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer that judgment, that investment uh, judgment uh, is a talent mm-hmm. that is not, doesn't have a gender, doesn't have a sexual preference, doesn't have a color. Uh, I have a hypothesis or a theory that, you know, kind of investment judgment may be equally distributed in our society and our population. And if that's the case, there's very little reason why so few dollars out of the institutional LP base goes to women and underserved minorities. So I think there's an untapped resource there. And I'm trying to capture or, or, or you know, just as I as we try to capture interesting opportunities in the investment side from our funds on my personal you know life and supercharged philanthropy quote unquote we're trying to capture that same opportunity i think there's an untapped resource which is basically funds that are led by you know people that look a little bit differently um different than than you know the typical you know venture capitalist or private equity uh, professional uh, and there's opportunities then to invest early on in these funds and and, and get outsized returns and and you know we're putting at supercharge we're putting our wallet uh where our mouth is yeah you know it it is one of the many things that impresses me so much about you and your career uh as i look at different naic member firms and i have this you know growing encyclopedia in my mind of about how they got started you know you continue to see the mark that you've made and the recycling of the capital You've created wealth. Uh, you've returned that wealth to your LPs. You've preserved some for yourself, and then you've you've invested that in giving others an opportunity. So, so in that regard, Jose, you are still an engineer, probably more of a civil engineer, and building bridges for people. Um, because one, you really do come from a place where you know that others aren't doing it, and yet there's a huge opportunity. So, I I think it's phenomenal, and it, it's really impressive. To, to think that, you know, two individuals, you and Kwanzaa, have invested $100 million in diverse managers, given the pr- plethora of things that you could have invested in. So uh, congratulations again to you all on that. Well, thank um, you. And yeah, on behalf of Kwanzaa and I, I would say thank you as well for everything that you do and NAIC does in the industry, right? You know, I think uh, this is not uh, a celebrated NAIC commercial, but... Uh, but it's amazing the work that NAIC has done over the years and, and the work that you uh, and your team does to, to not only identify that talent, but also to give people the tools, right? You know, to raise institutional capital and then to highlight to that institutional LP base that there is the most important thing, you know, performance is the product. I, it's what I tell some of, you know, kind of the young people that I invest with, performance is the product. And you have done an incredible job of highlighting the performance of this cohort is as good or better uh, than the performance of anybody else out there. So, 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 so thank you for what you do. No, thank You're you. Pretty pretty pretty. Um, if you could, so last question I'll ask you is what does the future look like, Jose? I mean, obviously you're, you're making a lot of history. Uh, I uh, have chosen purposely not to talk about deals, but there are a lot that we could talk about. And I, I chose the path of following you to see where you wanted to go. But what does the future look like uh, on any of any of your platforms? You've built several platforms where if we if we look forward, what should we expect more of? What should we um, you know, aspire to see from uh, from Jose Feliciano? Yeah. 
Well, it's, it's, it's a tricky question because I think actually in the, we are going perhaps through one of those interesting inflection points in our industry. And by our industry, I, I, I'm, I'm talking more broadly than just private equity, but really the alternative investment space is going through a really interesting transformation right now. We have had a few of those. You know, we had small private equity firms that became very large private equity firms. You know, those private equity firms, some of them went public at some point. Some of them have become multi-product uh, firms. Some of them have become now, you know, basically permanent capital insurance company affiliates, et cetera, et cetera. Right. You know, so we're seeing kind of a real interesting convergence uh, in terms of different products, different asset classes, if you will. Uh, we're seeing increasingly some of these firms, you know, tap the public markets in creative ways, everything from going public to BDCs, to SPACs, to other other ways of tapping the, the, the public markets. And the line between them, public and private investing is blurring a little bit. Uh, the line between a, an investment firm and an asset manager is blurring. Um, and and we, we're sitting in the middle of that, uh, clearly, right? You know, we have... We have created our, our the our path has been one that's been more of an old-fashioned path, meaning we have raised subsequent funds, and we have hopefully won or or or, or done well because of performance. Uh, and we don't want to let that go. You know that that is very much at the core of who we are, right? You know we're trying to every day we wake up and we're trying to to do well for our LPs and and. And, and, and make investments that ultimate, ultimately result in great funds. But at the same time, you know, we, we need to operate in this context. And I think uh, we have diversified the firm. For example, you know, we, we not only have now a, a private equity product, but we have a more what we call a hybrid product, a, a line of funds called the Clear Lake Opportunity Partner Funds. And those funds can invest in equity and debt and can do other you know, bespoke, um, interesting structure investments that, that that have, you know, kind of credit-like qualities from a downside perspective and contractual return, but can also provide interesting equity upside. We also have a credit affiliate uh, called White Star, which, you know, is investing in more pure play credit. Um, I think, you know, I, I see a future where obviously we'll grow each one of those different product lines, if you will. But I think we need to do that carefully, and we need to do that with the same commitment to excellence, to great performance that we have utilized over the past 15 years. The minute we lose that, I think we're gonna lose a little bit of that, uh, a little bit of that DNA, a little bit of that secret sauce that, that has made us unique. So, so I think my commitment to myself, to Bidat, to my firm, to Clear Lake and to our LPs is, you know, that we will continue to grow and expand. We'll continue to think a little bit differently. We'll continue to think outside the box. We'll continue to probably add different products or different things that we think make us more relevant uh, to our LPs, to our investors. But I think we're going to do that with that same commitment to excellence that has hopefully gotten us here. And uh, if we do that, I think we'll succeed. If we don't, you know, we'll lose our way and then we'll be one of those firms that, that you know, was great at one point, but but it's not no longer as great. And, and you know, that, that's, that's what we aspire to. Obviously, it's difficult. It's a very competitive market. Um, and you have to reinvent yourself almost every single day. Well, Jose, I'm going to let that be the last word, but I want to thank you for so generously sharing your insights, sharing your personal story, sharing the success of your firm. And moreover, I want to thank you for your example. Um, my job is made easier by people like you, uh, because I can point to the success. I can point to the firm that has not been around for 20 years yet that is, you know, kicking, you know, kicking the doors down and just really having a lot of success. And I can point to the, I won't even call you the next generation of leaders, the leaders in the industry now. So I thank you for that. Uh, congratulations on all of your success. And I wish you continued success to you, your family and your partners at Clear Lake. All the best, man. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, NAIC. We appreciate you. Yep. That concludes this episode. Great.